So here we go. Uh, this is kind of iconic, the introduction of the television set. And this is where so much of our work came from. I won't go into a lot of detail on where we started, but with the OSDIAB study, we were smart enough to include standard measures of physical activity and we included the measure of television viewing time. David Dunstan went out and organised the field studies, tested 11,000 people across the country, and then when we began to look at the, measure, the simple measure of how many hours a day on average would you watch television on weekdays and weekends and deriving a, a good quantitative measure of people's TV time. What we found was that uh, really across all levels of physical activity, so if you were quite physically inactive, moderately a little active or very active, the amount of TV time that you had really was related then to the likelihood of overweight and obesity or your, your body mass index. So we really got early evidence from TV time on what's going on. So that's kind of where we, where we got started with this work at the Baker. So I've got two talks. First one, uh, I will really get into my areas of incompetence, which is biological science and what goes on inside the body. And I'll then move out into talking about the real world out there and some of the work we do to make sense of how the real world impinges on people's physically active and sedentary behaviours and then their health. So I'm doing the first of these two talks, but they're very much thematically interrelated. So, developing the science of sitting. And this is just a nice image to remind me that you know, when we can look inside the body, uh, I can fantasise that I know a bit about what goes inside of the body, but when I talk to Arto or to Suvi, I know that really I've got no idea and most of the things I think I know are confused and wrong but I do read a lot of science fiction as well and somehow I fake it doing science. So I think this one is a, is a good one as an example of just how, you know, you can fake it until you make it really. Uh, or, or you might end up in jail, but so far that hasn't happened to me. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first off, what I will do is to uh, talk about some of the underlying ideas and the context of what we do run you through the behavioural epidemiology framework that Arto mentioned, talk about our experimental evidence that came up through the work in the Baker Institute Laboratories, a little bit of what we found doing workplace studies and trials to change people's sitting at work in other environments, and then where we're going with this, which is really getting into wonderful realms of science fiction in our work with Arto and his team here, which is to really begin to understand more about what muscle activity is happening when people sit and when they interrupt their sitting and how we can begin to use that to leverage a better biological understanding of how bad a lot of sitting is for people. So that's the story. First off, some key ideas and some context. And this just, I think, uh, puts in perspective uh, what we know, and if you go out to this side of things and you look at studies that have been done mainly in the USA, mainly with main male college students, and what, what we've worked out from that is a lot of very important things. But if we really want to understand much better why sitting might be bad, what we can do about physical activity in a public health context, we need to move down to this other end of the spectrum to understand are there important health consequences in people sitting and the kind of movement they do in their everyday life, which is a different frame of real life compared to 
the kinds of things that we've seen done in exercising. Now, there's a lot in there which I won't explain in detail, but the whole point of that really is to say there's been fabulous work done in exercise science. The work done in Finland has been just iconic for the field, and we know so much from that. But for public health, we need to expand how we think about people's active time and their sedentary time to think through what might we do in public health terms to seriously address things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even the metabolic cancers through activity that might be more realistically related to what people can do in their everyday lives if they don't want to get out and exercise or, more importantly, if they're very limited in, the ki in what they can do for exercising. And that is the case for a lot of older, overweight people at risk of these chronic diseases. Now, this, this will give you uh, kind of the fundamentals of what we work on, and you'll see the sedentary behaviour research network's definitions up there in English, and you'll see my, my translation of, of that into Finnish, for which again I must apologise. Um, uh, I, I had a lot of fun playing with Google Translate. I should have gone to chat GPT, which people tell me is a lot smarter. But anyway, apologies for that. But you can see down the bottom there that I've, I've had a go at communicating this in Finnish. So it's very simple. You know, inactive people are people who do not meet the current guidelines for moderate to vigorous physical activity. They are not out there doing regular physical activity or exercise, whereas being sedentary is the time that you spend sitting. And often these things still get confused. So I'll read exercise physiology journals and check on articles there and see where the exercise physiologists are and many of them are still just weaving together the idea of inactive with sedentary. So it's a very important I think to have that sense of what this is about. And I like this slide. We've used it in uh, versions of it in many of our papers and many talks. And if you think here here we've got moderate to vigorous physical activity. This is the whole waking day measured by accelerometers, objective measurement devices, and we have now data from many, many population groups. These devices now are part of a lot of population surveillance. And what we know is that on average, you're looking at, you know, about 20 minutes of moderate vigorous activity on average in populations. Now, that's on average. And that means that a huge number of people are doing very little indeed. And the vast majority of the way people spend their waking hours is sitting or being sedentary. And then, of course, you've got light intensity activity, which is an important determinant of energy expenditure, and it's got a high volume for people relative to moderate to vigorous, and a lot of potential to displace this time that people spend sitting. So I think this is, this is kind of very helpful to stop and think about. What is this telling us about how people are living their lives and what's going on? Now, very quickly, uh, Recently, the World Health Organization has done a review of the evidence on physical activity, sedentary behavior, and health, and have come out with new guide, relatively new guidelines in 2020, where they've gone from physical activity and health guidelines to physical activity and sedentary behavior guidelines, which is really interesting to see that that has happened. So this is what they're saying about sedentary behaviour and they've got good practical guidelines now from an authoritative international body. 
that's out there. The papers that were part of the scientific review have been published. And it was fascinating to me to see the pushback as people knew that these reviews were going on and the people who had a very strong commitment to moderate vigorous activity, that this is the focus, this is what we must promote, this is what the game is about, they were very resistant in many areas to the idea that we should be talking about sitting in this context. But the nice thing is we've got there, we've got physical activity and sedentary behaviour guidelines. These are now being manifested in national guidelines. You'll have seen this process in Finland. Our colleagues in Japan are just doing it. We've done it in Australia where it's now, well, what are the recommendations for the population and for different groups, older people, children, middle-aged groups, people with, with chronic diseases? What are the recommendations on less sitting and more physical activity? So we have a what is now, to my mind, a more broadly scientifically informed public health perspective and some pointers for what might be a more realistic approach to getting more people more active. Okay, so that's background. Moving on, I'll tell you Baker stories. And I'll tell you first quickly about the behavioural epidemiology framework as it manifests itself specifically in the work we do at the Baker. So what we have is the idea of having a strong basis for the benefits of changing sedentary behaviour for health. Now, we need the kind of evidence that I'll deal with in my first talk, which is a more mechanistic biological evidence. We need real-world interventions that show that you can change sitting and there are benefits to that. And to put it all together logically, you need good measurement with population surveillance. You need to understand just how much, how these things vary for different groups, different people and different circumstances. What are the determinants of the behaviour? And I've got a particular line on that that I'll give you shortly. And we test interventions and then all of this feeds into informing guidelines, policy and practice. And we've summed this up in our recent annual review of public health paper, which kind of puts this all together. So that's our broader logic framework for this. And moving to what we do at the Baker Institute, you can see here that we have moved from observational studies like the Ozdiab study where we looked at TV time, showed that was related, you know, however active you were to adverse outcomes, a whole series of, of studies that have been done, more recently been done, being done now with uh, accelerometers and objective measurement of physical activity and sedentary behaviour. So observational evidence is important. Clinical experimental evidence helps us to test hypotheses that are based on what we see in large populations to figure out, well, with these things we think are important, if we change them, can that really make a difference to things that seem to be important for health? So our Baker work, on which the Optimus study that Arto mentioned in his introduction, you know, is one of the important bases that work helps us to think what's going on here. And as we've got evidence on there's something important, there are some things we can see that are going on when we change people sitting. If we go out into the real world of workplaces or people's home environments and we do proper carefully controlled trials of reducing and breaking up sitting and increasing activity, when we do that, does it make a real difference? Is it acceptable? Is it effective? Does it change behaviour and biology? So it's moving into those more real-world trial elements of things.
So I'll tell you some stories now about the studies we've done. And uh, I think a special thanks to Patty Dempsey, who was one of our great PhD students that we've had through the program, who uh, had has spent some time at Cambridge and the Leicester Diabetes Centre, and he's now back in Australia working with us again. Uh, Patty uh, built on our original laboratory trials that David Dunstan, Genevieve and Healy and I cooked up to look at what happens when people sit all day relative to if they come in and sit and then get the opportunity to break up their sitting in our model every half hour for three minutes for most of our studies with typically with either light walking or simple resistance activities that we get them to do, demonstrating that when you actually look at this very simple ex experimental model in one of Patty's studies, you find really interesting things. First off, uh, what we find is people love being part of it. You know, this is one of our participants who's given permission to uh, to have his photo shown, and you know, there's there he is. Uh, he's on his on his sitting day, and all strapped in. You know, uh, we try to fit as many devices on people as we can, and uh, you know, and of course now, you know, Arto and Suvi and the team here uh, have taken that one step further. With uh, you know, I, I can't imagine all your your experimental people when they stand up, they will go clink, clunk, oh, <laughs> but we'll tell you we'll tell you more about that, and then they have a day of uh, within. Other days in our experimental model, they will do light intensity walking in a controlled way on the treadmill or uh, moderate intensity walking. In the case of this study, we compared light and moderate intensity walking. Then in other of the trials we've done, we've compared uh, light walking with the simple resistance activities. And we've got a whole body of quite remarkable findings where where we, what we see compared to a day of uninterrupted sitting on those days when people can stand up every half hour and do something that involves movement, there are huge differences that we see in insulin and in glucose and we've demonstrated it for blood pressure, norepinephrine, a whole range of, of other biological variables that show relative to a day when you spend sitting all day, days when you can stand up and regularly move and interrupt your sitting, biologically you look so much better. And one of the very interesting studies that Patty Dempsey did that he's published actually got people to do regular ratings of their mood, their irritability, their sense of fatigue. and. On those days when people just sat all day, they got more and more crabby, irritable, tired, fatigued, relative to the days when they could actually stand up every half hour and move. At the end of those days, they'd actually improved on those things, but that long day of sitting just left you feeling horrible. Now, we've got some amazing windows into that here in Mickley, which I'll tell you about. And this is another one of our findings where we used continuous glucose monitors to have 24-hour measurement of people's blood glucose and we followed them through the next night and over into the next day. And what we found was there was overnight persistence of the benefits for glucose using the new CGM monitors that are just everywhere now for getting, they capture interstitial glucose, which is glucose kind of near the, the surface of the skin. But they're actually a very good indicator of people's glucose status and how they're actually managing that with relevance, particularly to uh, diabetes. So remarkably, that there was overnight persistence of 
the difference between sitting days and regular breaking up days on, on their glucose. So we think we thought that was a remarkable finding and uh, Diabetologia just loved it as, a, as something with quite significant implications. And if we look across the whole pattern now of those laboratory studies that we have done and also now increasingly more groups in other places in the world have done, what we tend to find conceptually is that the benefits of regularly breaking up sitting actually seem to be proportional to people's degree of metabolic control. So if people are quite overweight, if they're pre-diabetes or if they have diabetes, then they get much larger chain beneficial changes in a whole range of these important biological parameters than you know, younger, skinnier, more fit people. Yes, you see effects across a whole range of different biological and behavioural states, but these benefits seem to come through so much more strongly in people you know, who are more metabolically impaired, which we think is, is a pretty important message. So with that laboratory evidence, we thought we'd better go out and test that in the real world. So we were able to make a very good case to our National Health and Medical Research Council that you know, we've got a body of observational evidence and experimental evidence in the laboratory, but does it make a difference in the real world context? And first, that was, can it make a difference in the workplace? So we did a, a very nice trial called Stand Up Victoria uh, with a very simple stand up, sit less, move more message. And we recruited office workers from multiple work sites into a cluster randomised trial. And this conceptually is, is what we did. If you think about working hours and what they would look like in terms of sitting, standing and stepping, well, we were trying to ch make changes in these patterns such that we saw more standing and stepping. And the findings are quite interesting because we were able to reduce sitting very significantly and that that change in sitting was sustained through to the longer term follow-up that we were able to do 12 months after the start of the trial. But most of that reduction in sitting was displaced into standing. People were largely glued to their workstations, they had a sit-stand desk and they're the changes that we ended up seeing. And certainly uh, not much in the way of stepping that we saw, but significant reductions in what we think is a key variable, which is prolonged sitting. So a big reduction in the time that people just spent stuck there, not interrupting their sitting and having it stretch out to an hour, two hours where they're just sitting, sitting, sitting. So this is an interesting study because we got a lot of reductions in sitting, but not much in the way of really active changes with the stepping. So that was an interesting and important finding for us. Uh, we have done a lot of looking at the data. We've got publications on the biological changes that went with the reductions in sitting. And what we found in broad brush is that when sitting, where sitting was replaced by more stepping, there were benefits for glucose, for insulin, for a, a range of biological variables, but less so when the sitting was displaced by standing. So interesting relationships that we've been able to tease out of how the behaviour and the biology weave together. All right, I will get a wiggle on. I note the time. Uh, 
So broadly what we've found is that, you know, from Stand Up Victoria, doing these things is acceptable, beneficial and feasible. Now, uh, we've got another study going on that I'll move through very quickly. That's a current trial. It's with people with type 2 diabetes. We have no findings yet, but we've learned a huge amount from the previous studies we've done, and we're really focusing on getting people, as well as sitting less, doing more, moving more. We're really focused on that. It's a two-arm, randomised control trial with a lot of detailed behavioural and biological measurement, and we hope that the, at the end of that, we will hypothesise that we can demonstrate that people can really change their sitting and it will have important benefits for glycated haemoglobin, which is a very good measure of, long-term measure of glucose control in people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So that's moving on. But the really cool stuff is, quickly I'll show you what we're doing here. So why do we want to understand what's going on? Well, if we really understand what's going on when we see these behavioural changes, we've got a rational basis for population health advice. We can do more personalised prescription for people because we know more about what is going on in there for whom. And we might, involve, might actually identify some unique ways of intervening, especially in type 2 diabetes, where people could get more personalised kinds of advice if we have mapped very carefully the behaviour and the biology. So there is, oop, oh, I did a bad thing. Yeah, so you know, one, one of our little kind of quasi chat GPT analyses of you know, what are the key words that pop up in our papers and what are we looking at across all those experimental trials and, you know, if you just kind of, you know, click the shutter on your eyes and take that in, you'll know everything that we've ever found out. So, there you go. So, we are doing a lot of work trying to tease out what these mechanisms are and Anna Pinto, who is now in Colorado, has done a great review paper we're wrestling with reviewers from a tough physiological journal where we've tried to make the case that it looks like there could be a unique biology of sitting that's different in important ways from the biology of exercising. So Anna, as you can see, has mapped that out for multiple systems. All right. Onto the real thing, and I'll have to do it more quickly. So here is the work that we're doing with Arto and Suvi and the team, and uh, they're fortunate to have Christian Brackenridge with them. Christian uh, was worked very closely with Arto when Arto visited us in Melbourne, and uh, Christian then has come here as a postdoctoral fellow. We use magic magic bike shorts. Okay. Uh, these are a wonderful piece of technological innovation from Finland, building on the work that Taya Finney and Arto and others have done here to tease out what can we observe when people move and when they sit at the level of electrical activity of the muscles. You know, when sets of muscle cells fire across different muscle groups what do we observe and what is going on? And what we see when you look at Christian up here is pretty cool. So these are the quadriceps and the glutes and the hamstrings. And this is the muscle activity, the traces going across there when Christian is just sitting. There's not, and look what happens when he stands up. Very interesting, especially given the work we've done, you know, and he moves and jiggles a bit and then he goes off and goes for a very light intensity wander around and plenty of muscle activity across there and he starts doing our simple resistance exercises, bang, look at what the quads are doing. 
And there he is, and you know, doing those, moving his legs out to the side. You can see how the hamstrings have to start to work and the, the glutes have to start to work. So it's absolutely magical. You know, the, the technology that you have here, the trial we've got going in the lab here with the Optimus study, it's bringing together what we've figured out in Australia around the behaviour and biology of sitting and interrupting sitting and what that might, why that might be important for diabetes to now begin to look at, well, what are the muscles doing and when you look carefully at what the muscles are doing, how might that be related to important changes in biology? And there may be very interesting recommendations into the future about what the, f what the kinds of physical activity that people do in the context of preventing diabetes or just being more healthy, when you think about what different, those big muscle groups down there that are so important for metabolism, for blood flow, and a whole range of things, what's going on and what can we do about it? I'll be very quick. Uh, what we see is that uh, the simple resistance activities, whoop, whoop, some things change electrical activity of muscles significantly. Light walking, jogging on a treadmill, you can see here a nice bar graph representation that shows very clearly you get very different electrical patterns of activity from the muscles. Uh, we're testing different countermeasures to sitting with standing, uh, light activity, pedaling, sitting down, walking, simple resistance activities. And from Suvi's work so far, it's certainly suggesting that as countermeasures, the potential of actually people being more upright and moving more really is where things are likely to be important and important things going on. And this is kind of cool because this tells us if you actually look at people just sitting down, what are those, what are things, what's going on? If you've got seated pedaling, things blip a bit, but then if people stand up and walk, there is so much more action within the activity of those muscles. So, where next? Finishing up, we really need to build and develop an evidence base that will give us a rational, mechanistic understanding of what are the changes people can make to their sitting for what kinds of benefits. Fascinating things to figure out. A whole range of those things that you can quickly read rather than try and understand from what I say in my Australian accent. Uh, the basic message is there are a huge number, I think, of potential public health and clinical implications of this that into the future, when Suvi has finished her PhD, we will understand perfectly and immaculately and can say some really good things. So, Suvi, no pressure. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.